This video is brought to you by friend of the channel Squarespace. Stick around to learn more about them as well as a special offer they're making available through my channel. Gamers, so obviously we did This Week in Video Games pretty recently. The last episode went out on Friday of last week, owing to my office being underwater. So this video follows pretty closely on the heels of that one. For that reason, there isn't a huge amount of chunky news to get through this week. This is more of a bumper episode to get us back on schedule. It'll be a short, sharp one, but hopefully we'll still have a good time. With that said, let's get to the news. By far the chunkiest news of the week is the reveal that Perfect Dark is in deep, deep trouble. You may recall this was announced sometime back in a teaser trailer courtesy of the newly formed studio The Initiative, which brazenly touted itself as the world's first quadruple A studio, whatever the fuck that meant. Those words sounded ridiculous when we heard them the first time, but they got even more suspect when it was later announced that Soul Reaver, Tomb Raider and Marvel's Avengers developer Crystal Dynamics was coming on board to help the initiative deliver the project. Back then the addition was sort of explainable since the initiative was still a small outfit and clearly a Perfect Dark sequel is going to need a lot of hands. This week though, the quadruple A narrative has come completely undone as a report from Video Game Chronicle reveals deep issues at the initiative resulting in a totally stalled game that has likely already been rebooted. Quote, as much as half of the core development team known to be working on the upcoming Perfect Dark reboot quit the company during the last year, or around 34 people, analysis of employee LinkedIn profiles has revealed, end quote. The article is extremely thorough, and I really recommend giving it a read if you have the time. It's full of insight from former staff members who share their frustration with the initiative's working environment, saying that the top-down approach of management didn't gel with the bottom-up approach that many people were promised when they were hired. The initiative is led by former Crystal Dynamics mixed luminaries, and so they're bringing in their old studio buddies to help plug the gaps makes a lot of sense since apparently they were hoping to bring in people more familiar with their working style. Development on the game is being described as quote, painfully slow, end quote, and a number of sources believe that the game has likely undergone some sort of reboot since the sheer number of new hires and exited staff would have made some sort of reboot inevitable. This is a bit of a blow to Microsoft, who are spending vast sums of money to build out their first party lineup. Perfect Dark was a flagship IP back in its day, and there was plenty of hype behind this latest reboot. Now it seems like a release date is very, very far away, and the problems here sound so profound that you have to wonder if this title will ever see the light of day at all. From one troubled development to another, Elite Dangerous. Now this one is well and truly shipped a long time ago, but it's always had a fairly shaky approach to new content cadence and quality. The recent Odyssey update was case in point, with so many bugs and game-breaking issues at launch, the developer Frontier Developments apologized to their community and promised to revise their development process in light of the troubles. Well, that revision has happened, and it turns out the solution is to cease development on the console port of the game. Quote, over the last several months, we've been wrestling with the best way to move forward, and it's with a heavy heart that we've decided to cancel all console development. We need to be able to move forward with the story of the game, and in order for us to do this, we need to focus on a single code base. Elite Dangerous will continue on console as it is now, together with critical updates, but we will focus on new content updates on PC on the post-Odyssey code base." End quote. I'm not sure how large the console player base for this game is, but I'm going to guess it isn't huge. Still, it's a bit of a bummer for those with no PC, since it means that their elite dangerous journey kind of ends here. At the same time, better for a developer to acknowledge their limits and deliver what they can, rather than stretch themselves too thin and deliver subpar products across the board. For what it's worth, Frontier has stated that they aren't stepping off Elite Dangerous anytime soon, so PC players can expect new content and updates for many years to come. A3 season is fast approaching and psych, no it isn't. You may recall that the loot box lobby firm and E3 organizer, the ESA, canned this year's E3 citing COVID concerns, even though they had already relinquished their booking rights to the LA Convention Center many months before that announcement, so it was a little bit fishy. When asked if they'd be running a digital E3, the ESA were also very evasive, leaving everyone to conclude that E3 just wasn't happening this year, or if it was going to happen, it'll be driven by publishers running their satellite events in tandem. Stuff like an Xbox Showcase or EA Play Live, etc. Well, at least one of those isn't happening this year, with EA announcing that EA Play 2022 is cancelled. In a statement to IGN, EA said, quote, This year things aren't lining up to show you everything on one date. We have exciting things happening at our world-class studios, and this year we'll reveal much more about these projects when the time is right for each of them, end quote. This is an a total surprise as EA's portfolio is currently in the early to mid development phase, with Respawn's Star Wars games and Bioware's Dragon Age still being some time off. In the absence of those, what were we going to get? The surprise reveal of Madden 2023? Another live Command & Conquer mobile esports tournament? 
PS, I would have loved that. Battlefield 2042's live service roadmap. Jeez, that would have been some bleak viewing. I know many people are celebrating the end of E3, but I'm actually bummed out about it. June just isn't going to be the same without all those big announcements and cringe moments. Quick update on Ubisoft's upcoming free-to-play shooter, Tom Clancy's X Defiant. Worst name ever, by the way. It actually isn't Tom Clancy's anymore, interestingly enough. Recently, Ubisoft announced a closed beta test you could opt into, and in so doing, they revealed the new branding and title for the game. Decidedly less graffitied and edgy than what we first saw, but also absent the Tom Clancy branding, that adorned the title the first time we saw it. This change makes a lot of sense because there was nothing remotely Tom Clancy about what we saw in that reveal. But to be fair, there isn't much Tom Clancy in most of the stuff Ubisoft slaps that label on these days. You know what I really want? I really want Ubi to do like a Tom Clancy reboot and make, you know, actual tactical games with cool geopolitical drama and it feels realistic, like Scottish people speaking Russian. You know, the authentic Tom Clancy experience that we all grew up with. Not gonna happen though. What are we actually gonna get? Tom Clancy commemorative NFTs. Speaking of which, that brings us to this week's edition of everyone's favorite segment, No Fucking Thanks. You know, I've really missed this segment this past week as game publishers have been all quiet on the NFT front. Luckily, someone has stepped up to fill the void, Dr. Disrespect. The Doc had a big week this week, finalizing his lawsuit with Twitch without any reference to a settlement or neither party acknowledging any wrongdoing. We still don't know why the Doc was banned and he still refuses to tell anyone, so this is just going to be some Jimmy Hoffa level gaming mystery that will remain unsolved until Martin Scorsese makes a movie out of it. The Doc was more forthcoming about his upcoming gaming project, however. He and a number of Call of Duty developer veterans formed a new studio called Midnight Society, and while the Doc's community has been eagerly anticipating the first news about his upcoming multiplayer shooter, their patience was rewarded this week when Midnight Society pulled back the curtain to reveal an NFT drop. Apparently you can go to the company's website and sign up to get some special commemorative NFT which is free, but you can also buy a Founders Pass NFT for 50 bucks which gives you early access to the game eventually and voting rights on game features. It's important to note that there is no game yet, it does not exist, the studio was only formed in like December of last year, so they're surely just tooling up at this point, but hey, you can now buy an NFT for it, so yeah, that's a thing. It's funny timing because this week the Financial Times put out a deeply cathartic article detailing the fact that the bottom is falling out of the NFT market, with NFTs dropping an average of 50% of their value in the last two months alone. Daily trading volumes on OpenSea, the largest NFT marketplace, have plummeted 80% in a single month. God, I love it. This quote is so good. Ready? By the end of last year, there was a general sense that there was saturation in certain parts of the market, particularly in primate-themed profile pictures, end quote. God, that is good. I'm gonna frame that. I mean, I'm gonna mint that. This one's even better. Ready? Quote, I think many people will be scared and burned by this market and may never touch NFTs again, said one 19-year-old investor. Other members joked that they would be living off rice, porridge, and grass this month. Oh my god, please stop. I can't handle all this joy. The collapse appears to be reflected in the gaming industry, where January and February were characterized by new, disappointing NFT announcements from publishers every other week, but the past few weeks have been an NFT ghost town with no new announcements and a general feeling that publishers are pulling back owing to intense backlash. It's bittersweet to say it, but it appears as though no fucking thanks as days are numbered. Rest in peace, you brave warrior. We will never forget your sacrifice. So what got announced or delayed this week? Well, first up, we got a release date for Axiom Verge 2 on Steam. The sequel to the much loved Metroid-esque arrived exclusive to the Epic Store and consoles last year. But on August 11th, you'll be able to grab it on Steam just in time for when your shiny new Steam Deck arrives in the mail, right? Probably not, but it will be a great game to play on your Steam Deck when it does arrive in quarter four. 2024. Dying Light 2 recently hit to pretty solid reviews, but if you'd like to go back to where it all began, then Dying Light 1 is getting a next-gen update. Techland took to Twitter this week to announce that a patch for PS5 would deliver 60 FPS at 1080p, 60 FPS targeting 1440p, but with dynamic resolution, and a 4K mode running at 30 FPS. 
If you're wondering why the Xbox consoles didn't get a similar patch, well, that's a good question. Techland didn't explain that, but they did make clear that an Xbox patch was on the way, so we can expect that at some point. Forgive Me Father is a promising, classically inspired shooter with one of the most arresting art styles I've seen in a long time. One part cel-shaded comic book and one part HP Lovecraft, Forgive Me Father's presentation alone makes it something worth checking out. It doesn't help that it's apparently a pretty great game as well, sitting at nearly 90% very positive since its early access launch last October. The game is officially out very soon though, April 7th to be precise, exclusive to Steam at first, but you gotta guess that this one will make its way to consoles at some point after that. Capcom held a brief Monster Hunter showcase yesterday, detailing what to look forward to in the upcoming Sunbreak expansion to Monster Hunter Rise. We gotta look at a bunch of new monsters we'll be hunting, gear we'll be collecting, and places will be exploring. Most importantly, we've got a release date June 30th arriving simultaneous on both Switch and PC. Only piece of delay news this week was from EA who confirmed that the Dead Space remake would be arriving next year, early 2023. There was plenty of hope out there that this game would ship sometime in 2022 since leaks seemed to indicate as much, but the official confirmation from EA dashed those hopes. Even though it's complicated to be excited for this one given how EA treated this franchise and Visceral, the studio that made it, Dead Space is still one of the defining sci-fi horror franchises and I'm certainly looking forward to seeing EA Motive spin on it since that's a very talented studio. So what came out last week? Well, it was a quiet week. We only had that Valhalla expansion and that WWE game, both of which we covered since reviews were already up for them. The only other release was Chocobo GP, the chibi Final Fantasy kart racer exclusive to the Switch that looked cute but turned out to be a bit of a wolf in sheep's clothing. The reviews for the game aren't anything to write home about, sitting at a fair 68 on Open Critic, but it's the in-game microtransactions that have set tongues wagging. Now recall that this is an almost full-priced game selling for 50 US dollars, but it seems to be so stuffed with in-game purchases that it looks and feels like a free-to-play game. Interestingly, and very typically, all of the microtransactions were disabled for the review window, but having now been turned on post-launch, it's clear that Chocobo GP is a twisted mess of multiple currencies, grindy unlock paths that can be sped up with real-world cash, and a season pass that gates off access to Squall and Cloud, two of the most iconic characters in the Final Fantasy franchise. I mean, imagine buying Mario Kart 9 and then having to spend more to play as Mario and Luigi. Having said that, I really don't think we should be giving Nintendo any ideas. Chocobo GP is another dud from Square, who started the year with a blog post promising to go balls deep on NFTs, and then two months later they shipped one of the most disappointing live service titles ever really, since Babylon's Fall struggled to break 1,000 current players on Steam during its launch window. Square has always been a deeply conflicted and contradictory organization, with some parts of it creating genre-defining masterpieces, while other parts of it churn out cynical trash. In 2022, Square has not been off to a great start. So let's hope things improve as we look towards stuff like Forspoken and Final Fantasy 16. So what's coming out this week? This is a pretty solid week actually with a good mix of remasters, ports, indie spin-offs and well, whatever the hell Stranger of Paradise is. Chaos. Kicking things off is Grand Theft Auto V's next-gen update, which arrives for PS5 and Xbox Series consoles today. The update adds the standard improved visuals and frame rates, ray tracing, haptic feedback for the PS5, etc. There's also talk of more traffic and world density, but we'll have to see how that plays out. Important to note that this update is not free, because of course it isn't. You'll need to purchase these next-gen versions as separate standalone products, and there's a 50% off sale running for the first three months of release, so if you want to grab them, then now's the time. Paradise Killer is a game that has remained very, very high on my pile of shame for a long-ass time. It's a weird open-world visual novel detective game hybrid where a murder has gone down, and it's up to you to solve it. It's famed for some strong writing, but also for how much freedom it affords you as you make your way through it and conduct your investigation. It's very often spoken about in the same breath as Outer Wilds, hence it being so high on my list. To this point, the title has only been available on the PC and Nintendo Switch, but tomorrow you'll be able to pick it up on both PlayStation and Xbox consoles. Tunic is a very promising Zelda-like that has all sorts of positive buzz behind it. As you can see from the footage, it's a more isometric take on the classic adventure format, but its clean visuals invoke that recent Link's Awakening remake that everyone loved, as well as Death's Door, which was one of the most critically acclaimed indies of last year. Tunic may be the work of a solo developer because there's just one dude's name listed as the developer on the Steam page 
stage, but don't quote me on that. This one is hitting Xbox and PC, and before you ask, no, it is not coming to Game Pass, sad times. Anno Mutationum. Okay, so this one's been on my radar for a really long time since I'm an absolute sucker for basically everything this game is doing visually. One part Ghost in the Shell, one part Fear Effect, and plenty of parts Cyberpunk. Anno Mutationum is a 2D semi-open world game that offers some light combat, but is far more focused on the exploration, world building, and storytelling. I'm actually playing through this one at the moment, but I can't share any thoughts since I'm under embargo, but not for much longer since the game is out on the 17th, exclusive to PlayStation consoles and the PC. Persona 4 Arena Ultimax is a Persona 4-based fighting game that is nearly 10 years old now since the original hit arcades back in 2013. It was eventually ported to the PS3 and Xbox 360, and now it's being ported to PS4, Switch, and PC. Man, Sony must really be paying Atlas boatloads of money to keep Persona stuff off Xbox consoles if they can't even get this one 10 years later. Anyway, I don't know anything about this one because I only played like the first 10 hours of Persona 4 Golden. Sad times. Shredders is a weird one. It's a snowboarding game that feels a little quaint in the era of stuff like Steep and Riders Republic, but clearly Shredders is aiming for a more enthusiast segment of the market than Ubisoft's catch-all craziness. It's got a nice, clean, realistic look. It promises a story mode as well as online co-op and plenty of slopes to carve up. This one is being put out by Microsoft since they sent me a review code for it, but I couldn't find any reference to it in the Microsoft store when I searched for it, and I've seen no marketing for it whatsoever. The email did say that it was coming to Game Pass as a day one release though, so you can check it out for yourself if you're keen. Finally, biggest and easily weirdest release of the week is Stranger of Paradise Final Fantasy Origins. This is a Square Enix published game, but it's developed by Team Ninja, the team behind Ninja Gaiden and the recent Neo games. I actually played through Neo 2 and absolutely loved it, though it did have its fair share of bullshit, don't get me wrong. I played through the Stranger of Paradise demo some time back and was unsurprised to find a solid game, but very surprised to see just how single-minded Jack was about his mission. This dude really wants to kill Chaos, and he isn't gonna let anyone forget it. Stranger of Paradise arrives on the 18th for all platforms bar the Switch. It already has reviews out, currently sitting at a strong 75 on Open Critic. Game Informer had a good write-up for it, scoring it a 7 out of 10 and saying, quote, Stranger of Paradise is the strangest Final Fantasy game yet, bounding wildly between awful and fantastic. If you can tolerate Jack, and that's a big ask, the excellently crafted combat is worth a look. You may be coming to this game for the story and Final Fantasy experience, but it's all about combat and little else, end quote. Want to see some of that weirdness? This is the actual cutscene where the main characters meet for the very first time. Take a look. Mm. Hm. Look, the crystals can sense each other. You have one too, don't you? My mission is to kill Chaos. That's all I know. Me too. Good. We're all in the same hunt. I'm Jack. Jed. Ash. After seeing that clip, I'm left thinking and feeling only one thing. Dudes rock. Dudes rock. Put this on your radar. <sighs> This is Morbid Metal, and it's a game I've been keeping my eye on for a while now, ever since I first saw clips of this thing being spread around all over Twitter. This is from a guy called Felix Shard Shade. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, I certainly did. And yes, the footage you are seeing here is made by one dude. Never ceases to amaze me what solo devs are capable of. This is already looking better than Babylon's Fall, and Platinum made that. Jesus. Morbid Metal is still early in development, but it's a sci-fi infused spectacle fighter, channeling the best parts of Devil May Cry and Bayonetta if it was fused with, like, Warframe or something. The exosuits you seem to be piloting can be switched out on the fly, mid-combo, and that just looks awesome. Like I said, this one's been in development for a while now, but it's only just got a Steam page and an official trailer. It's early days for this one, so if you're interested in supporting the project, you can head over to Steam and add it to your wishlist. Wishlisting helps out indie devs in a big way as they negotiate deals with potential publishers, or, you know, just get sales, since your wishlist notifications may remind you to pick this one up when it eventually ships. I'll leave a link to that in the description below. 
Sort of free stuff time now, and it's a very quiet mid-month week as per usual, so just a few things to tick off. First up is the Epic Store, which right now is serving up the very impressive City Skyline, the series that sort of picked up where SimCity left off after whatever EA did to it. Cities is only up until the 18th though, at which point it'll click over to In Sound Mind. So I gotta admit, I hadn't actually heard about this one, but apparently it released in September of last year, and the Steam reviews have it at 95% overwhelmingly positive, which is spectacular. The developers We Create Stuff describe it as an imaginative first-person psychological horror game with unique puzzles and frenetic boss fights. Usually the epic giveaways are pretty known quantities, but this looks like a bit of a left-field surprise, so that's nice, especially at the price tag Epic are asking. Breaking news, just as this episode was being put together, we got the monthly Game Pass refresh, and it's not bad. The Shredders game I mentioned earlier is there as a day one release. F1 2021 is there as a console exclusive. Crusader Kings 3 was one of the most celebrated strategy releases of the last few years, and it makes its way to Xbox Series consoles. The money shot though is Weird West. This is a debut title from the newly formed studio comprised of arcane veterans, led by the creative director of both the Dishonored and Prey franchises, Raphael Colantonio. This title is looking fantastic. I've seen an early build and it looks awesome. Immersive Sims are a personal favorite and this one is doing some really interesting things especially with its focus on gameplay over all the AAA bells and whistles that Raft's titles previously demanded. That's out on the 31st of March and will also be available as a day one release on Game Pass. So it's 1999 you've just seen the world's first perfect film The Matrix. As you exit the cinema your first thought is the same thought as every other 15 year old kid who just watched that movie. God damn that'd be a good video game right? Well, sort of, maybe. We had to wait four years for Shiny to deliver their half-baked and unfinished second movie tie-in, and a further two years for The Path of Neo, where Shiny just said, fuck it, and let us beat the shit out of Agent Smiths while controlling a fat Neo. Then there was a Matrix MMO, for some reason. That somehow lasted for four years, by the way, and after that, the era of Matrix video games was over. Until now. This is basically the coolest mod collection I've ever seen in my life. Obviously, it's based on Sifu, the recently released Kung Fu game. And while we saw Neo modded into that game on pretty much day one, subsequent mods would take things much further, significantly improving Neo's coat physics, adding a Matrix-themed color tint, and most importantly, adding Smith. Lots and lots of Smith. It's a rare instance where a mod transcends the game it's built on. I mean, just look at this. How fucking awesome is this? This entire time, we've been hoping that the developer Slow Clap would turn their attention to a John Wick game, but now it's clear what they must do. They must make us a game based on the other Keanu Reeves masterpiece. Point Break. I mean, The Matrix. And then Point Break. And then Speed. And then Bill and Ted. And then Chain Reaction. God, that movie ruled. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for the week. Like I said, short and sharp episode. Austin described this one as that mid-season anime episode that they used to fill their episode quota. And I really couldn't think of a more apt description. Still, you took the time to tune in and stick around, so I appreciate you. If you had a good time, then maybe think about hitting the like button because that's always a big help. And if you'd like to come back next week, but you're worried you'll forget who I am, then I got you. Just hit the subscribe button and ding the notification bell. It's like the YouTube equivalent of going steady. Do they still use that term? Am I dating myself with that one? I think that horse bolted with my shout out to Chain Reaction. Anyway, I've been Shill Up. You've been a great audience. Thanks very much, and I'll see you later in the week for the Destiny 2 Witch Queen review. All right, so I don't know how serious some of you might be about your clans or your guilds or your fire teams or your free companies or your whatevers, but if you are super serious about them, then maybe you might want to create a website for your community. It could be a place to help with recruitment, to highlight relevant game news, to plug in important Twitter feeds for updates, to memorialize your community's greatest achievements, or just to shitpost and share memes. If that interests you, then the good news is that that's really easy to set up thanks to Squarespace. Squarespace can get you up and running with a professional looking website in literally minutes. You just choose from one of their really schmick templates, you customize it to your taste using their intuitive tools, and boom, you are up and running. 
After that, there's so much you can add to it. You can embed videos or even host them on your website yourself. You can set up special members areas with exclusive content. You can connect social media accounts so you can easily share content you post and so much more. Plus there's detailed analytics tools so you can see how much time your community is spending on the site and what they're doing there. All of this is super simple. You don't need any knowledge or experience to get started with this stuff. Squarespace have put in the work to make this entire process so easy and so seamless even for absolute beginners. As I mentioned earlier, Squarespace are a long-term partner of this channel. Three years running now, actually. I really appreciate that support. Squarespace are helping me turn my passion into a career. And that's what they do for a lot of people because if you've got a passion that you want to share with the world, then a website is a really great place to start. To get started, visit squarespace.com. And if you want to get serious, visit squarespace.com forward slash skill up to get 10% off your purchase of a website or a domain name. Thanks Squarespace for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.